morning. Thank you. And I love your energy too. This is, um, especially with the weather getting really cool and all the social political stuff that's going on, you know, joy is, um, an act of like rebellion. It is an act of survival and resistance. So the joy that you have, um, well, not this morning, this afternoon, you know, is really, um, enlightening for myself and my heart. So just by being here alone, I already know my day for the rest of the day is going to be amazing. So I am here to talk about, um, so there's two particular books that I absolutely love and I have them, uh, right in front of me, actually. These two authors are so i can't even just describe how much i love these two books i don't even have the word so um the first book i love um is written by asada shakur and um and if you just read the first chapter everyone the first chapter is it will knock your socks off so she starts off just by talking about um her interaction with the police and how violent it was and she was essentially um engaged well she she was in a shootout and she was like shot up like her arm was like shot off but the flesh was still hanging on to her shoulder like the way she describes it is absolutely insane and then she goes to the hospital and then there were like white supremacists coming to visit her um give her long lectures on hitler and she was put in a male prison so um i'll give you a, a biography just a slight biography of her and how i will i will attempt to link her work to what's going on today um in higher ed um but the title of this presentation is called studying and struggling and studying and struggling is actually a quote from this book and i so i'll talk a little bit about her teaching strategy and what studying and struggling means and i feel like a lot more people should really like hone in on that and even though like with her teaching strategy even though it's like maybe a few pages long but it's so crucial i think to adopt in um college courses just the strategy of teaching so another one Elaine Brown will definitely um, get into that. It's called A Taste of Power. So Elaine Brown is the first and only woman to um, lead the Black Panther Party. And the stories that she has in here, like one of the most funniest stories is actually um, when so there was a concert in the Black Panther Party. They paid for Ike and Tina Turner to perform. And then there ended up being like this big, huge fight. And Huey P. Newton got into it with Ike Turner. And it's like, the, just like all the different narratives, the different stories that like make up the Black Panther Party. It, I mean, she really gives it like a different perspective. But also some of the other stories about the way women were treated in the Black Panther Party is just really riveting. It's heart wrenching. It, I mean, it just like breaks your heart. And it's also definitely a, a wonderful read. It's one of those books you can read in literally like one weekend. So um, without further ado, I'll share my screen. I only have like three slides. Um, the green box on the bottom. Okay. Okay, I'll just go entire screen. Um, I'm totally, I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out, uh, um, with the whole virtual learning thing. So I'm still, um, I'm still trying to work it out here. So can you all see my slide? It says band book series. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So just to give you a background of these two women um, and just like some highlights, really important highlights from the book. Um, so first, let's start with Elaine Brown. So Elaine Brown is an activist. She is a writer, singer, um, and a former member of the Black Panther Party. She was the first and only woman, chairwoman, um, to lead up the Black Panther Party 
Um, and yes, she does have an album, the album, a singing album, and it's called Seize the Time. And um, Bobby Seale's book is also called Seize the Time. So that's where he got his title from. So again, that's one thing that um, is not really often, often talked about. Um, so again, you're gonna see this theme where women are shaping these movements, right? And not necessarily getting the credit that they deserve. So after, um, so just to power on through her life story, right? So she grows up, you know, um, into her early 20s. And after Martin Luther King's assassination, she immediately joined the Black Panther Party. She was essentially outraged. Um, she talked about a former boyfriend that she had um, that really um, got her into um, thinking really critically about um, race and social justice in America. But after MLK's assassination, she was just like, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm getting ready to join the party. So she started off just like with really humble beginnings in the Black Panther Party. She was like cleaning up a lot. She was cleaning guns. And then she moved on to building programs for legal aid. Then she helped to build the um, free breakfast for children program. And for in LA in particular, and for those that, um, and, and I don't know um, the age, <laughs> um, the age of the individuals that are watching this, but if you could remember, um, if you had free breakfast or if kids that you know that had free breakfast in your school, that is because of the Black Panther Party. They were the, the ones to start that. So um, she helped to build that in Los Angeles. And also what she talked about in her book, which I did not know, is that in LA, their breakfast was like vegan. So the Black Panther Party in LA served vegan breakfast. And the reason why was because they operated their first program inside of a church and the subset of Christianity did not allow um, eating meat. So they did not eat meat. So the requirements for um, the Black Panther Party to have their breakfast program, the church said that you cannot serve and prepare meat on the church grounds. So, and I thought that that was very fascinating. Um, and, and predominantly Black women made these organizations run on the ground. So um, later on, she talks about so many different stories, um, but again, just to like ram through all of this, cause it's, I mean, you can create a whole college course <laughs> on these two books alone. So it's gonna be really hard to narrow it all down in like a half an hour or so, 20 minutes to a half an hour. So she became um, a minister of information. Um, so basically taking over the role of Eldridge Cleaver. I don't know if you all know Eldridge Cleaver, um, but he's actually um, a very incredibly violent, violent person at the time. So he was expelled from the party because he had like a really bad anger management problem. Um, and uh, he just became like increasingly irrational and he would just have like these um, spurts of violence, just these violent outbursts. And she talks in her book, um, A Taste of Power, Elaine Brown, for those of you just tuning in, she talks about in her book, like how he tried to kill her while they were in Algeria. So um, for those of you who do not know who what Algeria is or where it is located on the map, Algeria is a country in Northern Africa and is situated next to Morocco and Libya. So while they were, um, forming the Black Panther Party on an international scale, she writes, I mean, for several pages about how he threatened to kill her. He threatened to kill her in her sleep. She was scared to death. So um, also there, that's like another um, thing that you might see is this idea of Black women's violence um, and how Black men perpetuated violence against Black women in these organizations and how incredibly sexist um, and violent they were. So, um, 
So when Huey P. Newton fled to Cuba, I was believe it's like either in 73 or 74, you all have to fact check me on that. Um, so he was, at the time, Huey P. Newton was facing murder charges of another theme, murdering a black woman. Okay, so that's another theme here. So he appointed um, Elaine to run the party while he was gone to Cuba. And part of the things that like, she talks about, which I thought was incredibly fascinating, which no one really talks about, is like the complexities of individuals. Like there's usually like a stereotype of what a Black Panther Party member looks like, the ideology that they hold. But she talks about how she would send um, Huey P. Newton like his Rolexes and stuff like that to Cuba. So it just goes to show you that even the leader of like this very powerful organization that was all about smashing capitalism and critiquing capitalism and smashing it and all that stuff, how he himself still engaged in like this um, conspicuous consumption, if you will. So he lived in like a high rise apartment, all that stuff. So she took care of all of his affairs. And even still, he had a girlfriend as well. So, um, so nevertheless, she was kind of dating Huey on and off. So he appointed her to lead the party. She was the only woman to do so. Um, and she left um, around 1977 or so. But in, so between um, the time when Huey fled to Cuba, there was an incredible rise of black women's leadership in the Black Panther Party. And as you all probably can guess, there was a lot of backlash, okay? So um, during that time, um, she helped to elect the first black mayor, um, and she talks about her role in doing that. And she and a woman um, by the name of Regina, I can't think of Regina's last name, um, but helped to start um, the Black Panther Party's Liberation School. So she has like, in, like a lot of stories about that. So again, these were all, so the, the party was moving, it was growing, and they started to have more power in mainstream politics. So having power in mainstream politics, you get to shape the policies, um, the rules, the laws, you know, so they were really moving into that particular area in, um, in the city of LA, um, and really like beyond and also like around in that area. So, but then she eventually, she said, uh, so people say that she left the party. She escaped basically. I mean, um, and it's the same thing with Asada. Asada escaped from prison. She, Elaine Brown escaped from a different kind of prison. So um, she escaped because remember the woman I told you, her name is Regina, Regina Davis, that's her name, um, who helped to start this Panther Liberation School that was incredibly successful, wildly successful. So because she told one of the workers, which was a, a, a black male worker, a person that was under her, she told him what to do. And I think it was something like he might have been late and she was just like, you need to be on time, you know, just like regular things that what bosses do. So the man got upset. He got really mad. And so Huey had a lot of pressure to do something about it. So during this time, Elaine Brown talks a lot about how if you went against the party's rules, then you would be beaten for it. So it's not like you get demerits, like, okay, you get one, you, you know, you break three rules and then you're out. Okay. It didn't work like that. Like they would get beat up. So, um, so Huey, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Huey ordered the beating of Regina and he got a lot of pressure from a lot of men saying that she was out of her place and, you know, 
you know, she doesn't know the struggle and that she needs to include men more and who does she think she is and all that stuff. So they beat her up brutally. And after that, Elaine Brown was like, I am leaving. And she talks about in detail how she left. I mean, she covered her head. She had to sneak out. You know, she snuck all the way to the airport. You know, she covered her face while she was on the plane. And then she eventually escaped and she left the party when she could no longer um, tolerate the incredible violence that ensued. So, and that's kind of like pretty much the end of the book. Um, so, and I believe Elaine Brown actually ran for office, I believe it's the Green Party, um, around 2008. So she's still really active and she does have another book out as well that came out um, sometime in like the early or mid 2000s or something like that. I have to look it up. I haven't looked it up in a while. So um, on the other hand, Asada Shakur, who is the other author um, I will discuss today. So um, due to time, again, like I'm just going to plow on through this just to um, allow um, time for discussion. So Asada Shakur, as I said before, her, her, the first chapter is absolutely, I mean, you just can't not take your eyes off of it and you cannot stop reading it. So, um, she left the Black Panther Party and eventually became a member of the Black uh, Liberation Army. So, but in the first chapter, she talks about how she was in a shootout, um, on the New Jersey Turnpike. So she was, um, what makes her case really interesting is that um, during Elaine Brown, Elaine Brown talks about just the story. And during this time, there, Elaine talked about how they didn't really know anything about Cointelpro. Um, but here, Asada is like literally being attacked specifically by Cointelpro. So it's kind of like two totally different narratives, but still very, very important. So she, um, even though um, her medical records um, and her own testimony and the testimony of others, even though it aligns with her innocence, she was still convicted of murder, um, attempted murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, all that stuff. So they put her in a male prison. Um, and the thing is, um, and she talks about um, the experiences of being in a male prison, just how horrible it was. She said something about um, while she was in there, um, they kept like flashing an incredibly bright light in her eye and they kept the light on um, for hours and hours and hours and days and upon days. And she literally felt blinded. She said that centipedes and ants were crawling all over her. And then for a while I couldn't stand ants and I couldn't stand centipedes mm. because I would think about her, um, as she was laying in that jail cell and just so many other just, um, horrible, horrible con conditions. Um, but just going back to um, her college years, so she became um, po um, very politically active. She talks about the process of that um, and how she grown in consciousness. So once she became politically active and she started to um, attend community college, that's where the whole studying and struggling quote essentially came from. So, um, so but then after graduation, she joined the Black Panther Party. So she increasingly became disillusioned within the Black Panther Party, not just because, uh, um, in addition to, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but addition to the extreme amount of violence that was taking place and the rampant amount of sexism and violence against women in the party, she also became like really disillusioned because she just felt like the way that they were teaching um within the schools just did not align with the perspectives that she essentially wanted to see. Um, and just going back to like the incredible amount of sexism, I one thing that sticks out to me in, in Asada's book is that she talks about um, the US organization, meaning us as black people, which was led by Malata Karenga. And um, she recalled a time where Malata Karenga and all of his friends was like talking about Angela Davis and like what she was wearing and stuff. 
And can you imagine that telling Angela Davis like, oh, why are you wearing that skirt? Like what? Like who does that? You know, but again, if you put it in a context, like back in the 60s, you know, that's the way in which they treated women. I mean, today, I mean, I can't even imagine, right? Um, someone even wanting to say that, but I'm sure Angela Davis definitely still um, gets tons of pushback, right? Just for being black and being female and being a radical lesbian and being conscious, right? Conscious. Um, so, um, but she talks about how they had a problem with the way in which women dressed at the time. So um, a lot of her complaints dealt with the Black Panther Party and um, their strategy of teaching. So um, she believed that all they did was just quote these words, you know, and they didn't know what the words meant. So like empty slogans in the classroom. So for instance, an empty slogan could be um, education for social transformation, but it's like, okay, what does that mean? Okay, so that's an example of an empty slogan. It sounds great. It makes a great hashtag, right? So and still that conversation is still going on it's like we have a hashtag but what's the what's the steps that we're going to take in order to get to the hashtag right to make the hashtag real um so she also said that the black panther party did not study nat turner they didn't study the contributions of harriet tubman what happened on the Combahe river how harriet tubman um defeated the confederate army um, at the Kambahe River Raid. Um, there was no conversation about that. And she says that there was too much of an emphasis on um, Karl Marx um, and just too much emphasis on white radical philosophers. And there was like no conversation about Marcus Garvey. So um, then she joined the Black Liberation Army. Um, and then she was going back to the first chapter. She was in a shootout. She was targeted by um, police forces. And now she is considered to be um, the most wanted terrorist um, by labeled by the United States government. And she is the first woman to ever be labeled as such. And she is currently in Cuba, still alive, and I suppose well. So um, just a, a brief overview, and I'm gonna get to the conclusion of this and why this is so important. Um, to study, um, especially with the social political context that's going on right now and how it relates to black women in higher education. So um, this is just Elaine Brown's perspectives on education. And even though, even though these things are like literally like two pages, but they are so, so crucial um, to facilitating um, um, any sort of change on um, the higher education uh, uh, scale. So what she says, which is so fascinating, is that students are natural allies of the revolution or any sort of radical change for the better. She says that students are outside of the power structure. She says they're not necessarily workers and you may have a job or whatever, but she says that that doesn't really necessarily qualify. Like you're, you're a student. She says you're not part of a bourgeoisie and she says, um, as of yet, there's really no relation to the means of production and you have no real class status. And I think we can kind of see a little bit of what she's talking about, like with the protests, the recent protests that was happening all throughout, um, all throughout the summer. Um, and they and, and what was beautiful um, about um, the protests is that they were so, so, so diverse. But then she says until they graduate from college, then they are ushered into the power structure. So basically just recognizing the power of the students and where they are and how much change that they can get done simply because you are a student. And this is really her definition of a student and why they are so crucial in raising their voice in order to shape um, any kind of power structure or any kind of American institution, including higher education, what they can do um, and how powerful they are and where they're located. So um, Asada Shakur says, um, Again, she creates this, she says this, and I quote, studying and struggling, and I just loved it. 
Um, and the study in the struggling really talks about how teachers ought to struggle with their students. So while, for instance, so when I'm teaching um, my courses in multicultural education, so while my students are also working out their privilege and they're working out different concepts, I too am also with them and I'm in it and I'm struggling with them and I'm constantly critiquing myself, I'm constantly acknowledging my privilege that I have and I'm constantly trying to grow and do better and to be a better ally as well. So that's where the concept of studying and struggling comes in. Also rejecting slogans in the classroom. So very similar to what Elaine Brown was saying. Um, so how do we go about, how do we go beyond the hashtag um, and make it a reality? She also says that the classroom ought to be family oriented, right? So this idea of like the classroom and sharing like this communal space and that we're all related to one another and that no perspective is better than another, but more so just like a um, collection of various perspectives and various ideas that make up like a mosaic, um, if that makes sense in the classroom, which is honors is all about. That's what we try to do in our classes. <laughs> um, and she also says, um, students are at the center of creating new knowledge and to study the perspectives and the philosophies of people like Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner. Those were the examples that she gave. Um, so just to um, wrap this up here. So the narratives of these two women paint a larger picture about Black women's experiences. Despite movements like Black Lives Matter that have been founded by Black women, public discourses about Black Lives Matter have often focused on Black men's lives and deaths from the state. Um, yeah. So, and that's good, you know? So I'm not knocking that, however, um, but I think it's also important to be a lot more inclusive. So this state sanctioned violence within both is also noted um, within the stories and the narratives of Sha Shakur and Brown all throughout their books. So when attention is given to the violence against Black women, they are often blamed for their own victimization as demonstrated also in the narratives of these two women. So this idea of you're too strong, you don't know how to listen, you're not in your place, so therefore you should not be a part of this movement, but they definitely fought against that. Black women's work as a driving force of the civil rights movement, so like Septima Clark and Frances Beale, Black, um, the Black Panther Party, and now, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement often overlooks to solve this problem and seek to integrate Black women's studies. So the important thing is to how to um, dismiss that or how to move beyond um, the erasure of Black women in higher education is to include them in more namely intersectionality in higher education curriculum and our courses. So along with state sanctioned violence that Brown and Shakur talk about, institution state sanctioned violence contributes to the erasure of Black women in social justice projects and in education. Their intellectual contributions, such as the misuse of intersectionality, as Patricia Hill Collins says in her new book entitled Intersectionality as Critical Theory, white nationalists also draw upon the variation of intersectional analysis in defending their claims that white working class American men constitute a neglected minority. So this is an example of an exploitation of black women's work and an erasure of black women's work. Um, that has taken place in higher ed. So using the experiences of Elaine Brown and Asad Shakur as an entry point, they expose multiple forms of institution sanctioned violence experienced by Black women. This same lens can be used to highlight how the same work of erasure of Black women teacher activist scholars experience, in, experience marginalization in higher ed. Therefore, studying and struggling, their pedagogies,
their contributions of these two women and all black women in higher ed are needed as a blueprint on how to carve out space to study black women's contributions and intersectionality in all academic fields. So I do know that because of the deaths of, um, well, the murder of Breonna Taylor has definitely opened up a um, an opportunity to, you know, for Black women to explore um, um, how this violence tends to occur and how we can do better. So I am uh, I am finished. So I am uh, open to hearing any questions. I'm just trying to unshare my screen and to turn on my video. Okay. All right. Can you see me now? I think so. I hope I didn't talk too much. Did I talk too much, or was I okay? Talk. You know, unless you want to do it in in sign, and then most of us won't understand. She did a very good job. Thank you. Do we have questions? How about some questions? Anybody have questions for Dr. Patton this morning? Anybody? I'll try my best to answer. <laughs> but yeah, I just love these two books. I just love them. You know, I just, I have to read them at least once a year. When did you, know? you find them and how did you find out about them? Um, you know, I've always known about Asada Shakur. Um, I stumbled on, um, I would just see her, Elaine Brown's name just every once in a while. But then um, while I was working on my doctorate, I started to get really um, deep into just Black women's history um, as it pertains to education. And I just felt like a lot of the books that are already out there, there was a gap. And I just wanted to know like who was doing the radical work and I mean, not to shade any like Septima Clark and, you know, Anna Drew Cooper and, you know, I mean, they, I mean, they're the goats, right? Um, but I wanted like a different, you know, perspective. So I stumbled across or I revisited Elaine Brown and I saw the book and the, on Amazon. I'm like, oh, this look good. And then I just could not put it down. So I started to notice like, some deep similarities between these two authors and author and also differences as well. So, and I just became, you know, really, really interested in it. So I tried to, you know, write about it um, in my dissertation and I couldn't um, because here, never mind. <laughs> but as you know, like dissertation writing gets... Yes. <laughs> but um because I could see um how it would fit but you know it it didn't so I just became really interested well thank you thank you do we have any questions from YouTube or Facebook from the chat circles well I think we should do a chat this is from Dr. Mungo. Give all books a chance. Ra, ra, ra. <laughs> Give all books a chance. Ra, ra, ra. Give all books a chance. Yes, give all books a chance. <laughs> Read on. Now and forever. <laughs> well, well, no, I normally want to make you think 